Guys, uh, Brad here from Scooter Street. Have a really good video here for you today. We um, really appreciate your subscriptions and your comments, um, and um, we've noticed how popular the previous uh, build video was on the um, the Piaggio Zip. So we thought we'd um, uh, definitely respond in kind and do some more build videos. So today, I have a Yamaha Zuma uh, engine, which, uh, if you're unfamiliar, is the uh, vertical early Minarelli engine before the, the later horizontal engine. Um, now these were found on the, um, the MBK booster overseas, um, but the same bike in Australia was called uh, the, um, the Zuma 50. Um, also uh, sold as the BWS or the BW50, the Yamaha. So um, uh, this customer here um, has actually uh, damaged the spline on the crank at the variator. And unfortunately, uh, with a damaged spline, the only real way to fix it is to replace the crank. So he's figured, look, if I'm going to do the crank, I may as well do it properly and you know uh, replace it with some performance parts uh, if I'm going to be in there spending the money. So what he's actually done, uh, he has uh, removed his engine, uh, chucked it in a box and shipped it to us. So we're going to uh, fit all the parts. I'm uh, going to replace the crank. Uh, while we're in there, we're also going to do a um, lossy 70 kit. Uh, got a, um, a Technigas Next R exhaust as well, and um, uh, just a Molossi variator, and then the, uh, the appropriate tuning parts for that as well as the jets. Uh, obviously, we're going to do the crank seals and bearings while we're in there. Uh, and I've got a little Polini roller tuning kit there for him as well, which is a, a really great kit um, if you're fitting a Molossi variator to a bike that's not otherwise standard. Keeping in mind that uh, those Molossi variators, the uh, just a normal multi-bar 2000s, um, the roller weight in the kit is designed uh, to be suitable for an otherwise totally factory scooter. So this one's not going to be factory, so um, we've got a, a lighter roller kit there for him as well. Obviously suiting that 16-13 uh, size as opposed to the factory variator being the smaller 15-12 uh, roller weight, or roller size, sorry. So what we're going to do, going to strip this engine down um, and um, show you the stripping down process and the process of building it back. Um, obviously, we're going to be a little bit limited in terms of the tuning we can do, um, but uh, we will discuss sort of the, the settings that we're going to give the engine back to him with. Obviously, he's not shipped the, um, the carburetor, so we can't change jets and that sort of thing. But uh, other than the crank being a high compression crank, a uh, full circle crank, it's going to be a pretty, uh, pretty basic sort of build, just a uh, sort of a street scooter, um, sort of a basic 70 build. The, the next R, Technogas exhaust, is just a basic street exhaust. Um, and uh, as is the Molossi Sport Kit. So uh, th these are a really cool engine. We've uh, uh, fitted and tuned some 70 kits and some cool parts on these before. The, the best thing about these, these engines is they're super, super simple, which makes them really easy to work on. Um, so um, we're gonna get into it. I'm gonna start stripping this down. And then um, uh, once we've got the, the, the casing split apart, we can start installing some parts. Obviously, your crank's the heart of your engine. So. Uh, it's really where it needs to start. Get everything apart, get the, get the, um, the factory crank out, get this um, high compression crank and the bearings and seals in, and then we can start building the rest of the engine uh, out from there. So I'm gonna start stripping him, and um, we can get into it. Okay, so first thing to do is gonna be to strip most of the extremities off the engine. Uh, so this is gonna be obviously uh, the fan, flywheel, and stator, which we'll need a flywheel puller for. Um, uh, any other obstructing items that would uh, stop us from being able to split the casing, uh, like the engine mount uh, pin, it's uh, just held in by some circlips, uh, the main stand, um, any additional extra parts, uh, the transmission will have to come apart. I'm not looking to unnecessarily pull uh, everything off the engine, uh, but just the necessary parts that are going to be obstructing us from getting that crank apart. So I'm going to speed some of this footage up to make it a bit more fluid, um, but um, I'll, I'll start getting everything off and um, we'll, uh, we'll start getting this engine pulled down. Okay, so we've got the, uh, the flywheel nut off uh, with the fan, but I'll just show you this because this is fairly particular. So this is, uh, to get the flywheel off, you need a flywheel puller tool. We sell these, this is our one for the workshop here. So the way this works, the flywheel itself has an inner thread, and obviously there's the thread of the crank, uh, the end of the crank there. So uh, the way this works on this particular engine, um, it's a reverse thread on the inside of the flywheel, which um, is matched by this flywheel puller tool, which has an internal bolt that then does up uh, on the inside of it. So the way this is done is by carefully inserting the thread, which is reverse. Uh, I think most of the Minarellis are reverse. 
um, whereas the Piaggio is just a standard thread that uses the same system. We're going to go ahead and put the internal bolt in. What that does is the internal bolt pushes against the end of the crank uh, while um, uh, essentially the flywheel is being pulled outwards. So we're going to use our impact driver here with a 19mm and this should fairly easily pop off. There we go. And uh, there she is. So just pop that off now and then we have access to the stator. So with the Minarelli engine in particular, you would need uh, a flywheel puller tool anytime you're going to be doing anything with the stator uh, or anytime you're going to be doing anything to do with the oil pump. Because uh, particularly in the Chinese, the CPI engine, which is the, a copy of Minarelli, um, uh, they have commonly an oil pump failure, and it does sometimes happen to the Minarellis as well. So unfortunately, to access the oil pump, you do need to remove the flywheel to get that, um, uh, to get that stator plate off to access the oil pump in behind there. So I'm going to continue, um, but just wanted to show you that in particular, because that, uh, that is a, a particular part of um, uh, removing uh, the crank casing obviously using that, um, that flywheel puller tool.
Okay, I've pretty much got the engine mostly free of obstruction. Just need to uh, remove this um, engine mounting pin. I'm going to pop this piston off beforehand just so uh, I'm not worried about it uh, potentially flying around and damaging something while I'm removing the um, the crank um, or splitting the crank casing. But one thing I will show you is just this here. So you can pretty clearly see it's in the video there. I might get a torch actually. Might make it a bit easier. There we go, got the torch. Okay, you can pretty clearly see there that the end of the crank spline on here is just um, really badly chewed up. Now, um, uh, this can often happen if the outer pulley comes loose uh, or is damaged. Though the outer pulley is alloy, um, if, it, um, if, if the, the, the damage is bad enough, it um, can actually um, cause the end of the crank spline to, um, to be ripped apart. And I've seen this happen on a Piaggio before as well with a loose crank nut. Um, where it um, essentially just destroyed the spline on the crank there. So that's, um, that's uh, although it seems like a um, uh, not that bad of a failure, unfortunately it means that the entire crankshaft has to be replaced, which is um, like, um, like doing a triple bypass on a scooter, basically, you know, doing a heart replacement. So I'm going to um, get the, the rest of these couple of bits off, get the piston off, get the, um, the um, engine mounting the engine mounting pin off. And then we can start removing the um, uh, the crank or the carter bolts, the main crank casing bolts, and we can split the casing. Okay, so I've just, um, uh, this uh, engine mount pin here um, just has two circlips on the inside, so I've just removed one back to about halfway and just tapped the pin through the bearing here, just enough that it's clear of this. So when I split the engine casing, the um, that pin will just come away with the left-hand side of the casing. So we're pretty much ready to, um, to split this casing now. Um, one thing I will say is it's a really good idea to, um, uh, particularly if you're working on an old dirty engine, um, to um, to give all of the little hex bolts that uh, that are really attach anything, but in particular um, the um, the actual casings, give them a bit of a clean up because if there's a bit of oil or grease or dirt or just general grime in there, what it can do is when you put your um, your hex key in, it can discourage uh, the hex key from wanting to sit all the way back uh, in the hex of the bolt and just encourage it to strip that bolt. And if you strip one of these, um, which uh, you know in, uh, unless you've um, uh, done your engine casing before was a good chance they're still uh, still seated from the factory so there's a good chance they're a little bit corroded in place so they're going to be a little bit stuck so uh, anything that you can do uh, to reduce the possibility of stripping that hex is uh, is worthwhile doing so give them a bit of a clean up uh, with stripping the casing I'm going to remove all the bolts but if um, if you do remove all the bolts and it's just not really wanting to come apart um, there's a good chance you've maybe missed something so um, it's a really good idea uh, to, um, to go back over and check everything, clean it all up, um, because it, it's really easy, especially when it's, when it's quite dirty, to miss one of these bolts. So if you're having to put excessive force on, there's a good chance there's something wrong. This uh, casing should split relatively easily. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and um, uh, try and make sure I've got all the bolts, give it a bit of a clean up while I'm there, and um, we'll, um, we'll get this, um, this casing apart.
Okay, so funnily enough, after I mentioned how easily uh, these hex bolts can be stripped, the worst possible one on the inside here where the oil pump sits that could possibly strip has uh, uh, our, our you know trusty old uh, tool has turned over twice in it. So the biggest key with, uh, with this happening is once it's turned once or turned twice inside it, you stop immediately because uh, if you keep going, you're just going to continue to uh, to round out the bit. So um, in this particular case, this uh, this engine's come out of probably uh, a '91 or a '92 model bike, so it's like a 30 year old engine, and uh, these um, these bolts have definitely have been in there since factory. I can tell. So it's probably uh, there's a good chance it's maybe a tiny bit corroded in there, um, but um, either way, it's a little bit stuck in place, which is why the the tools turned over twice in that particular bolt and none of the others. So um, in this case. Um, because I've got our, our trusty old tool here, it's a little bit rounded on the edges. It's still good, but it's just worn because it's it's used in the shop every day. So um, the biggest thing, like I mentioned, once it happens once or twice, you immediately stop, and um, uh, you need to address it a different way. Otherwise, you're going to continue having the same problem. So what I've done is flown down to the shop, got myself a brand new uh, five mil hex bit. Now, obviously, because this is brand new, it's got really nice fresh edges which uh, is what eventually wears on a hex bit, is uh, the edges. So these are beautiful, nice and fresh and sharp. I've um, uh, sat it down in there, made sure that it's clean again. Uh, set it down in there, uh, tapped it into place with the hammer to make sure that uh, that hex bit is all the way in the bottom of the vault. So I'm um, utilizing every single bit uh, of that um, grabbing surface in there as possible. And um, it has come free, fortunately, because that would be a real nightmare if that one didn't come free. So um, like I said, uh, I cannot stress enough that if a bolt is turning in place, whether it's a hex bolt, Phillips, uh, what have you, uh, immediately stop what you're doing and address it a different way. Otherwise, you're just going to make the problem worse. And uh, it very quickly gets to a stage where um, uh, any potential solutions you may have had available to you um, are no longer available because you've stripped the thread uh, beyond belief. So um, fortunately, I've gotten this one out. So I'm going to go ahead and continue popping these bolts out. But um, I'm going to put that bolt aside because um, you see this uh, this bolt here is bent, so I'm going to have to replace that. But um, I'll take both those bolts down to the um, down to the bolt shop and and get replacements for both of them. Because the last thing I want to do is put that bolt back in there for um for the next person to have an even worse time with trying to get it out because um it's um, it's half stripped. So I'm going to get the rest of these bolts out and uh, split this casing and continue as we were. Okay, now you notice while I was taking these out, the time I was holding them in my hand and comparing each new bolt that I had removed to the one or the ones that had been removed previously. And the reason for this, uh, in this particular engine, all those bolts are the same length, so there's no problems there. But uh, in the case of many other engines, and other Piaggio engines like this, um, there are a couple of bolts that are a different length to others. So uh, what I do, removing one at a time, comparing back to the ones that I've already removed, if I notice one is shorter or longer than others, Seeing as I've just removed it, I know where it goes. Um, what I'll do is I'll make a small diagram. Uh, what Ray a mechanic often does is he'll make a small diagram on a piece of paper and um, he'll poke the bolts through the holes in the paper as it pertains to the diagram uh, so that he knows when he puts the engine back together uh, which bolt goes where. Uh, in my case, I'll generally lay them out in a similar pattern uh, to, the, um, uh, to the way that the bolts are set out in the casing, but it's just whatever works for you. Um, just as long as you have some way of being able to um, reference back to when you're putting the engine back together which bolts go where. So um, what I'm going to do now, uh, I'm going to sit one of the nuts um, on the end of the, the casing here and I'm going to use our, um, our uh, plastic ended hammer just to gently tap and you can use a, a metal hammer but the biggest thing is just being really careful not to damage that thread which is why uh, you put the nut on, uh, on the end. So I can try to variate a nut actually the correct nut. Set it on the end there. And then I usually put something over the uh, uh, over the um, over the end there. So when I'm tapping it, it's not actually contacting the end of the thread there uh, to damage it. It's uh, only contacting the outside of the nut, which is not going to damage the thread because it's 
uh, dispersing that force along quite a, uh, quite a number of threads inside the nut and not denting the end of the, um, the thread there, which is really important. On this particular engine, there's actually uh, a bit of, um, uh, the, the, th the thread is only cut sort of three quarters of the way up and there's a tapered uh, sort of flat end on it. So it'd be very difficult to dent that to the point that it would, uh, you'd have problems with the thread. Even though I'm removing this crank, uh, I still feel a little bit of mechanical sympathy for it and uh, not wanting to destroy it. So I'm gonna pop the woodruff key out before I do that, because that's quite important. If you lose that, then uh, it's gonna be uh, a bit of a pain for you. But um, I'm gonna um, go ahead and get that woodruff key off and, uh, and tap this crank out gently and uh, we should see the crank casing start to split from the center there. Okay, so obviously we've got our factory crank out. This is the crank here. We've still got a pretty badly damaged spline on the end there. So hence the reason for uh, replacing this crank. So uh, usually nine times out of 10, the, the crank will come out with the bearings attached to it. If they are still stuck in the casing, uh, you'll unfortunately need to get a bearing puller on there to pull them out. But 99 times out of 100, it, um, it comes out, the bearings both come out on the crank. So um, the next stage is going to be to um, uh, obviously take uh, any parts off this that we'll need, like that nut will need to come off. Gonna need to uh, remove the left hand side crank seal. I'm gonna give these crank casings both a little bit of a clean up because uh, the last thing you wanna do is put it back together and some dirt from outside somewhere, you know, goes on the brand new crank and it's, to, it, it's not something that you want, particularly if you're doing a big rebuild like this, you wanna give it a bit of a clean up while you're in there. So I'm gonna go ahead and clean these up. Then we're gonna grab our, um, our new crank and um, have a look. Um, and have a look at the bearings as well. And I'll sort of explain the process of um, how they go back in because uh, it is a little bit particular. So I'm gonna go ahead and clean this all up and we'll come back in a second uh, and um, have a look at this new crankshaft. 
Okay, so I've given the engine casings a good clean up. I was sort of hesitant to clean on the inside of the right hand side because I really don't want to have to clean out all that factory uh, grease for the oil pump and then re-grease it all. So um, I've left that, um, but the inside's all been cleaned up. And I'm on the right hand, uh, on the left hand side, sorry, uh, on the transmission side, I have um, given the inside of a, a fairly good clean up because there's a bit of corrosion and stuff around there, uh, as you'll see with you know 20, 30 year old old uh, odd uh, engine. So obviously I've given the inside a fairly thorough clean. Uh, you get a lot of dirt and, and rubbish and grime that flicks off the wheel and ends up around here. So uh, we've uh, tried to get as much of that off as possible. Um, so the next step's going to be to sort of have a look at our our, uh, our replacement crank, which I've got just here. So obviously this is a full circle crank. Now just as a good comparison, we've got our factory crank here. So with the top of the um, the big end uh, lined up, but you can see the difference is fairly obvious uh, straight away. And the factory crank has all this open space, whereas the full circle crank it's all sort of filled in, and it's got just enough space in the centre for the um, the conrod to travel through. So the idea with a full circle crank or high compression crank is that um, obviously the, the areas of space uh, inside the factory crank um, would normally be filled with air and fuel, which can be compressed. Uh, those spaces are primarily filled up with metal on a full circle crank. And obviously you can't compress metal, uh, not like uh, you can air. So what ends up happening is it increases the overall compression of the bike, uh, and in particular the drawing compression through the carby. So um, uh, in previous experience, when I've uh, I fitted a, uh, a high compression crank to a scooter that otherwise stayed the same, as I had a damaged spline similar to this one, uh, that bike was running a, a 70 kit as well, and it had been running the factory crank with a 70 kit prior. Once installing uh, the high compression crank, so having changed nothing else about the bike, only having installed a high compression crank, uh, the jet size that the bike had previously was far too rich. And the jet size actually had to come down quite considerably. And this is because the high compression crank is drawing so much more um, that uh, you don't need as large of a jet size because there's physically more draw. Um, so um, it, it is interesting, but uh, you wouldn't think it would make that much of a difference, just that little feeling of metal, but it really does make a fairly significant difference. Obviously, is the cr if the crank is more easily drawing more fuel and air, then it's able to make more power more easily. So you get a fairly, usually a fairly significant increase in torque when you um, install a full circle crank. So um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, chuck this in the fridge. Now the reason for that is uh, the uh, crank bearings when they sit in the crank, sorry not the crank in the fridge, I'm going to put the bearings in the fridge. Um, the, uh, the reason for this is um, uh, when the crank bearings go in, um, they need to sit in there and not move. The outer of the bearing needs to seat in place and not move within that seat. If you have a bearing, the outer of it is moving within the, um, the casing, you've got a, a big problem. So the way that you get them in there without damaging or causing as least damage as possible, um, uh, seating them in is by using uh, thermal dynamics, basically uh, cold bearing, hot casing. So um, uh, heat the casing up with a heat gun, which causes the metal to expand ever so slightly. And then we'll put the bearings in the fridge, which will cause them to contract ever so slightly. So uh, when we've got the casing heated up and it's ready to go, the bearings been there for 10 or 15 minutes, being metal, it doesn't need long, it, it cools down pretty quickly. We'll, uh, we'll seat the, uh, the bearing in there. The, the idea is to get it in quite quickly and then very quickly tap it in place. The quicker it gets in there, uh, the less time the, uh, the cold and the heat have to sort of dissipate each other and uh, equalize out to a temperature. So um, quicker you get it in there, uh, the, um, the less that happens and the, the easier it goes in. If you do this really, really well, um, the bearing just sits in there and it just, that's it, goes in perfectly. But nine times out of 10, it's probably closer to, uh, to be honest, 99 times out of 100, it'll, uh, it'll sit in there and you have to very quickly tap it in place. Now this is done using a, uh, usually using a socket or if you have a very uh, wide uh, hammer, you can do it that way. But the idea is to put as least stress on the bearing as possible. You really only wanna be putting stress can uh, show you on this uh, factory crank on the outside whoop, on the outside of the bearing not the inside because you can potentially damage the cage and uh, damage the balls whereas uh, this outside here is quite solid and that's the part that you really need to be uh, pressing into the casing so we've got our bearing seal kit here obviously with two seals and two bearings this is our Minarelli kit so this uh, suits the vertical and the horizontal Minarelli but um, one thing I will note is uh, it's good not to take these out of the packet straight away uh, because uh, Keeping them in the packet and then putting them in the fridge essentially keeps them safe from any uh, additional moisture or condensation building up on them, which you don't want. 
uh, while they're um, while they're in the fridge. So pop them in the fridge when you're ready to use them. Pop them out of the packet once you've gotten them out of the fridge, and then they're ready to go straight in. So uh, obviously the Minarelli, uh, similar to the Piaggio, uses the same size bearings on both sides of the crank. So you're uh, no need to worry about which bearing goes where. Now, if you're rebuilding a different bike uh, that's not a Minarelli or a Piaggio engine, say for instance, like a Marini is a good example, the Marini uses a different size bearing on both sides. So it's important that you take note of which bearing you're doing at which time, so you don't have to redo the work. Now, um, uh, on that note, the seals are obviously different. They are specific to each size, but it's uh, usually fairly obvious that the, the large seal goes in the um, in the variator side. One thing that's really good about the um, the, uh, the stator side seal on the Minarelli engine, it has this little lip on there, so it has like a stopper as it goes in, which is quite clever. Now, obviously, um, we're gonna wait until the bearings are done to, um, to even look at these seals. They're gonna go in once the crank casing has gone back together with the new crank in it. So I'm gonna chuck these in the fridge, and I'm obviously gonna keep the packet on them, and um, then we can probably look at start heating the casings up with the heat gun. Okay, so I've got our right hand side casing here. I'm about to heat this up. So I just wanted to quickly mention, I've got uh, just a normal electric uh, 2000 watt uh, heat gun here, which is what we use. The reason we use this, if you use an oxy or a flame type torch, you can actually damage the casing because these types of torches are able to get so hot that they can um, actually go beyond the, the, um, the operating temperature of the, of the metal and damage it. And um, particularly if you heat it up so much, if you do need to use the hammer uh, to tap the bearing in once it's um, once it's mostly seated in, you can actually end up cracking or damaging the casing because it's it's gone beyond its um beyond its recommended heat or beyond its usage heat. So definitely best to use a um, uh, a normal uh, electric uh, filament style operated gun. So I'm going to go ahead and heat this up. I've got our, our bearings in the freezer; they should be pretty cold by now. Usually, only takes five or ten minutes with them, and um, we'll um, we'll see how well we seat this bearing in. Okay, just being very careful not to touch the casing. Hey, all the way in, straight away. Just gonna let that sit because that's really hot, but um, that's uh, made me look really good, hasn't it? The uh, one in the one in a hundred times that it just goes perfectly in. Now I'll probably sat here heating this up with the gun for a good four minutes. Um, yeah, the, the, the key is a being prepared. Got my tool here ready to go if I did have to tap it, but um. Also, not trying to rush it and um, sitting there and really adequately heating that casing up. So it's just gone beautifully in there and I'm uh, really happy with that. And I can always, already, it's already, you know, it really doesn't take that long. Within a, within half a second, it's expanded and it's uh, it's jammed right in there. So I'm going to just leave this out to cool and I'm going to uh, start heating up the um, other part of the casing. Okay, round two. I'm going to start heating them up and let's see if we can uh, get this bearing to go in as easily and nicely. Okay, let's see if this one goes in as easily. Hopefully it does. There we go. Just went on slightly on an angle and it got caught up. There you go, that's the key with being prepared. I was able to tap it in really quickly. And as soon as it straightened up, trued up, it just fell straight down to the bottom again. So really happy with that one. And if I, yeah, that's already well and truly stuck in there. So I'm just give it one more tap just to make sure that it feels really solid. Yeah, that's, hear that metal clinking sound and you know straight away, the bearing is really well seated all the way. Like I said, it was just, when I put it in, it was slightly askew. And um, as soon as I tapped it down a little bit, it, Straighten itself up and just fell straight down to the down to its uh, to its proper seated position. So I'm really happy with that one. I'm going to let both these crank casings um, uh, cool down a bit, and then we'll um, have a look at um, uh, addressing that process of getting the crank in and getting all back together. Okay, so we've got our crank here. Our crank cases are pretty much cooled down and ready to go. Now at this stage, before we go putting the crank back in, it's very very crucial that the crank bearings and the big end bearing. Uh, of the crank are oiled. Now, uh, the reason for this, if I am, um, just press this down for a moment. I need a keen ear, hopefully the camera picks this up, but if I spin this bearing, 
I wonder if you can hear that. Maybe not. But the bearing's quite dry. It moves smoothly, but it's got the tiniest, tiniest little scraping of grease in there from the factory. It's not oiled. Now, what would happen is if you were to put this back together, um, basically, uh, you'll, you'll, as soon as you start it up, you'll observe quite a loud whirring noise that'll be coming from the um, dry crank bearings. I've seen this before, people who have uh, done crank rebuilds and not oiled the bearings. Now, the other really important thing is the big end bearing on the crank also, uh, it's very imperative that, it, yeah, that it's oiled. That bearing is designed with a certain amount of clearance. Now, the clearance is there to allow A, for it to move, uh, and B, for oil to be able to enter in, which is what these uh, slots on either side are for, for oil to enter into the bearing and lubricate it. You notice it also has these little shims here. Now, I've seen, uh, uh, likewise in the past, um, uh, people not uh, oil the bearing and um, have a loud rattling noise, even just at idle, particularly when the crank's not moving fast, a loud rattle because there's no oil in that bearing. It's a dry bearing. Uh, and um, there's a reason that you have two-stroke oil in your two-stroke. There's a reason that four-stroke uh, four scooters, uh, that the bath, the end, the end, bottom of the engine sits in a bath of oil because uh, mechanical moving parts, in particular bearings, in fact, most imperatively bearings, must be lubricated. They cannot be dry. They, um, they have excessive movement when they're dry and they can burn out and damage the engine. So what I'm going to do, just have our bottle of two-stroke over here. We've just got a tap on the, uh, on the top of our bottle. It's really good to use a, uh, a good uh, high quality two stroke oil just generally, but when you're doing the engine rebuild, something that's nice and, uh, nice and thin, like the, uh, like the shell we prefer, or the motor was also a really good product, because it'll get into all the little uh, small uh, nitty gritty fine areas of the bearings and keep everything really nicely lubricated and uh, not overheating and, and uh, certainly not noisy, which uh, not the noise is the issue, it's that the noise is indicative of um, a larger problem, which is a lack of lubrication. So I'm going to go and chuck some oil in both of these. What I usually do is uh, I'll just put this to the side here gently. What I usually do, got a little pump on ours, which makes it easy, but I'll usually just a tiny bit of oil in it. See it just starting to come out. Okay, tiny bit of oil, and then rotate the bearing for a little while. And that, uh, as it works around, it works all the oil into the bearing. A little bit more. And uh, you can actually even feel immediately that uh, uh, the bearing doesn't have that um, sort of, uh, uh, you can almost feel the sound sort of slight um, rumbliness to it as you turn it around because it's been lubricated properly. So I'm gonna chuck a little bit more oil in there. You, you don't wanna flood the bearing, but um, turn it from the other side as well just so all the oil doesn't pull out the back. Okay feeling pretty good. It's a good sign if you can see that the inside of the bearings all quite shiny and it's uh, shiny from the oil being in there obviously. So that one's looking and feeling pretty good. And I'll just replicate the same process with the other one in a moment. And it's pretty much the same process with the crank bearing. Uh, get it sort of so it's 90 degrees to the, um, to the top to the center of the stroke. So you've got this slit nice and open. And now uh, it's gonna be the same process of just gently putting a little bit of oil in there. I usually just flick it around. You can usually hear the oil sloshing around in there. But um, it pops on the other side. But, but the good thing is you, you, don't, you don't have to flood it with oil, but um, it just needs a little, a little bit in there worked around. There we go. But what I'll often do as well, is um, uh, just get a little pan of oil off to the side and um, just rub some oil sort of just generally all around the all around these um, surfaces just get everything really nice and lubricated it's only going to prevent rust so everything nice and lubricated and I usually rub a little bit on the inside of the casing as well so but just not on this flat face which we'll, we'll get to in a moment but I'm just going to finish lubricating the uh, the left hand side bearing and we'll um, have a look at um, the rest of the process of getting this back together. Okay, now the next part, which is pretty much the final part before we put the crank casing back together. I'm going to clean around the outside of this. Now this is outside the machined part where um, the two halves of the crank come together. You can see it's got a little bit of uh, sort of grayish residue, which has to do with the next part of what we're about to do. Now, because there's no gasket between these two halves of the crank, 
what we usually do is use a, um, a high temp Gaskin silicon type product. Uh, you can pick this up from uh, from most um, from most shops, most automotive shops. But um, the key with this stuff is using a very small quantity of it and placing it on two clean surfaces. Now, what I like to do is just get rid of it on my finger. Now, the crucial thing is getting the inside surface around these bolts isn't super important, but um, I usually just go around them anyway. Yeah, the key is not having, not leaving big dags of it all around the place. Now, you will get a tiny bit of squeeze out when you put it back together, which is okay. This stuff's not going to harm your engine, it's just going to burn up. But you don't want to use so much that it just um, is oozing out everywhere and is disgusting. Just a wastage. Now, um, like I mentioned, it's, it's rather important you use the high temp stuff. But um, usually you only need it on one face. And you just want a, a thin smear around the entirety. Now, all this does uh, is just uh, helps to prevent any air or fuel leakage when those two halves of the casing go together. Now, I'm just going to put a tiny bit around these edges. If you have a nice fresh tube, you can often um, uh, use the fine tip to get it through, but um, this is not a fresh tube and um, the silicon in the tip has gone off so I can't, I can't use it anymore. It's sometimes a little bit more accurate doing it that way though. Okay. Not too much, but um, we've got a good level of coverage around the entire face. Now like I mentioned, only one side. You do not need to do both sides. By the time we put this casing together, it's going to be about a micron thick. So I've got that silicon. So I'm just going to run around the inside, my finger, and just start any excess which is dagged out onto the inside. Get rid of it just to reduce the amount that ends up inside the crank casing. Again, not because it's a huge issue, but just because it's not necessary. Okay. Okay, so we're pretty much ready to go. Both uh, crank bearings have been lubricated. Our big end bearings being lubricated, and we've got our gasket silicon ready to go on the um, on the bottom of the crank casing. So, obviously, uh, variator side uh, shaft through the variator side casing. So, what you're going to gently do, slide that in there. It'll slide into a point, and it'll start to stop. Now, the big key with this is uh, taking your time and um, uh, being sensible with what you're doing. So, uh, essentially, what we want to do here is we want the two sides of the casing to slowly, evenly, uh, and gently come together. Now what can happen is if you, um, uh, if you put uh, consecutive bolts in together or if you just bash it together with a hammer, you can end up jarring the casing and it doesn't sit together nice and straight. What we wanna do is um, uh, sit that there. I'm gonna grab this side. Sit that over there. Now, obviously there's quite a number of crankcase bolts. What we wanna do is try and get at least three in, in like a triangle sort of shape, so they're uh, across from each other, uh, so they can, uh, as we tighten them, uh, uh, seat the whole casing, uh, or seat the casings together evenly. Um, so what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna gently tap the outside of this, uh, very gently, because this is rather thin. In fact, what I might even do is uh, uh, get something to tap on the inside here where it's machined and a bit thicker, but gently tap on it until those cases are uh, close enough together that I can get some of the um, the casing bolts, slide them through in a uh, in like a triangle shape so they're across from each other, evenly apply pressure, get them in at least a couple of full turns in, so there's uh, a fair bit of thread uh, pulling them in. But what you don't want to do is have the uh, start doing these um, doing these bolts up while they only have like half or one thread on because it can put excess uh, pressure on the soft alloy thread on the inside of the casing and end up stripping it. So. You, we don't want to start applying pressure on these bolts uh, until they're at least a couple of threads uh, turned in first. So I'm going to gently tap it until that's the case, and um, then we'll um, we'll start doing those bolts up. 
Okay, I apologize for the short pause. My, uh, my camera actually ran out of battery, but uh, we're not actually a whole lot further. Uh, you see, we've still got sort of six to eight mil there before the casings reach each other. Uh, all I've done is um, sit each of the bolts in place and um, uh, they've sort of, I'm fairly comfortable, they've all, uh, the thread has bitten and then they've um, uh, sort of had a good three full turns uh, before they've started to, um, uh, to get tight, which means that we've got a good amount of thread uh, for the bolt to start pulling that casing down, uh, as opposed to if the, uh, if the bolt had only sort of threaded uh, one thread or one full way around, there's not a lot of thread there holding the bolt and it can have the potential to rip the thread out. So it's exactly what we don't want. So I'm quite confident each of these bolts has uh, got a fair bit of thread uh, that it's working with. So what we're going to do here, the most important thing is that we crisscross the pattern to uh, gently and evenly disperse the pulling force uh, provided by these bolts, pulling the two halves of the engine casing together. Now, uh, it's exactly the same as if, you, uh, if you've been trained properly to do the wheel nuts on your car. You never ever do them around. You always do them in a crisscross pattern so you keep the force even. Because what can happen is if you do it around pattern, suddenly you've gotten halfway around, uh, this side of the casing has all the force and this side has virtually nothing. You can actually jar the casing and break it in a really extreme case. So it's very important that uh, following that crisscross pattern, that the casing generally is, uh, as you tighten each bolt, is uh, uh, each uh, amount of force that you apply to each part of the casing is then equalized on the other side. So we get a nice, gentle, and um, uh, consistent, even force of pressure pushing those two faces together. So um, one thing I will, will mention is if you haven't done this before, every sort of three to four tightens, you'll notice a slight sort of knocking, sort of clanking sound, which is normal. This is what you want. All this is, is uh, essentially what happens is as you tighten a, few, uh, a couple of the nuts, um, uh, a tension builds up between the crank and the bearing, whichever is, obviously it's gonna be the crank and the bearing that's moving over the crank. Uh, and it essentially sits down in little steps. So you'll tighten a couple of bolts, you'll notice it get a little bit tight, and then you'll go to tighten, say, the third or the fourth one uh, in your rotation, and then it'll sort of loosen a little bit just because the, the, um, the casing has just sort of slipped down that little bit more, and it'll continue to step down until it's um, all the way seated. So I'm gonna go ahead and continue doing these up. You'll probably hear that little noise in a moment. So when we're doing this, talking like quarter turn at most. So my arm's a little bit loose, but once you have tension, at absolute most, quarter turns. There it is, that clanking noise. So notice when you come to each bolt, every now and again, after it's had that little clank, where it's sat down a bit further, the bolts will all be a little bit loose. So when I say a one quarter turn, I mean like say from 12 o'clock to three o'clock, but if the bolt is loose when you get to it, you don't start that quarter turn and tighten until you feel that the bolt has grabbed, like there's tension on that. I've come to say a bolt that I haven't touched in a couple of it, uh, a couple of turns. See, that one just is loose. So I'm not gonna start counting the quarter turn until, there it is, it's under a little bit of tension, and now I turn it. starting to get fairly close so what I'm going to do now a little trick I'm going to sit this screwdriver through the eye of the conrod so I know that that conrod is going to be sitting in there it isn't going to accidentally get clamped in the crank casing which would be very bad 
So I'm pretty comfortable. That has seated nicely. Now the next thing I check out is squeeze out. As I mentioned earlier. So here we go. This is what I mean by squeeze out. So you'll see all the way around the casing. Obviously, these have a little bit of a, a lip manufacturing, which is normal, but you'll see that squeeze out of that gasket glue pretty much all the way around. I didn't put any gasket glue on that out of it there, but all the way around, which means we've got a really nice seal. So what will probably happen here, nine times out of 10, is the crank will be really tight and you'll, uh, you'll panic if you haven't done it before. This is normal. All you need to do, I'll probably use the soft end of this one, is gently tap either side a couple of times, not with a metal hammer. This is uh, sort of like the fluffy material on the end of it, so I can't damage the spline. Just move ever so slightly. And then on this side. That should be. Yeah, there we go. Much freer now. You can give it a couple of taps, but all that is is just um, obviously all the tension uh, as you put it together. There's just a little bit of tension being held in the bearings. And um, just tapping the crank either way just kind of seats everything in place properly, moves it back and forth, and uh, gets everything loosened up. I'll probably give this another tap in a second, but that's all looking really good. So um, pretty much what we're ready for now is to, um, uh, to to clean it up a little bit. Any residual oil hanging around the place um, from um, from putting it together, and then we're going to um, uh, look at putting our seals in, and we can sort of start reassembling. I apologize guys, but as this is a fairly long video, we've had to split it into two parts. So we will endeavor to bring the next part of it, which is pretty much gonna be the assembly um, of the rest of the engine, putting all the parts back, cylinder, and um, assembling the transmission uh, inside the next two weeks. But we will be putting some more videos up between now and then. So I just wanna say, I really appreciate your views guys and your subscriptions, and uh, uh, those allow us to continue making more videos as well, where I'm pretty busy operating our shop as well and, and making videos in between so we really appreciate your support and if uh, you could like and subscribe and show these videos to your friends who have scooters and uh, try and use them to uh, twist their arm into tuning their scooters up as well thanks very much guys really appreciate your support